Hello. Greetings. Are you chatting with the student in the game? <laughs> no, I'm just typing this up. I'm going to show it all here. I guess it's 3 o'clock, so I might as well uh, <laughs> show it now for everybody who's here. Um, hang on just a second. Let me finish this up. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so uh, for everybody here now that it's 3 o'clock and we're also recording this and we're getting ready to get started here. Um, just a quick announcement before John kicks off his um, lecture. Uh, a reminder about the pass no pass option for this quarter. Um, there's two steps that you have to do and you've got until Friday of week 10, which is next Friday, uh, to do both of these, if that's something that you wanna do, if you wanna switch. Um, and I, the message log here is actually going backwards. So obviously I'm gonna post this in Canvas. So the first step um, is to submit a major requirement waiver through the easy petition system that we've got on our department's website. Um, this just gives you the option uh, to use pass, no pass. It does not actually assign your grade as a pass, no pass. To actually make the switch, if that's something you wanna do. So you can submit the waiver and then not do it. Um, that's perfectly fine. When you actually want to make the switch, and the switch is irreversible, so once you switch it in uh, WebRedge, that's it. You're on that track. Um, that's the other step, right, is you submit the petition first, and then you go into WebRedge afterwards um, to actually make the switch if you want to switch over to something like that. Um, the major requirement waiver is I'm the one who approves those, and they're just blanket approved. Um, you don't have to provide any reason whatsoever other than I want to do pass, no pass. Um, that's that's all the reasoning you have to do. Um, and then, yeah, you've got until Friday of next week um, to do both of those. Next week uh, on Monday, um, we'll have some grades posted for some of the remaining um, projects. So the, the project two that you just turned in, as well as the, the homework you just turned in a little while ago, um, both of those grades will be posted, uh, as well as a um, 
what do I call it? What should I call it? Grading scale, right? So you can go in and calculate your grade and find out what letter grade you would get. Um, so that can help you decide whether or not you want to switch over to a, a pass, no pass, or a letter grade. The there's no guarantee, right? Your grade could still change a little bit depending on how you do on the final project and this last homework. But in my experience, they haven't changed a lot um, going from from one to the other. So. Yeah, the project grade will be posted on Monday. Um, and uh, is the petition and the easy request the same thing? Because they're two separate websites. Uh, yes, the petition and the easy request are the same thing. Um, the one that's different is to go onto WebReg and actually select uh, whether or not you want pass, no pass for the, the course or not. Uh, I don't have the class averages calculated, but all of that is going to go into the grading scale that I'll post on Monday. Okay, so those are the only announcements I want to make. I'm going to, will the homework and quizzes be dropped? Yes. Um, I mean, you'll have to calculate, right, the, the drop for your intermediate grade. But yes, we will still follow the, the syllabus, so you'll still get to drop a homework and two quizzes. Okay, I'm going to let uh, John take over, and I'm going to shut up. Can everyone see my screen right now? Uh, yes, in chat, if you can. OK, cool, perfect. Um, so today we're going to be uh, going over nonlinear regression it's, um, uh, to continue what uh, Dr. Drews was talking about. Yes, uh, not yesterday, Wednesday. Uh, we went over um, sort of uh, uh, linear fit models, and um, today we're doing non-linear fit models. So, uh, as as far as how to perform it in MATLAB and sort of all the underlying fundamental statistics in terms of the you know the importance of the p-value, the r va r squared values, um, those are all still they all still fundamentally apply to to what we're going to be doing here. So, um, just as a quick refresher, um, a couple ways to tell that you have a uh, sort of good model once you run sort of either a linear model or a nonlinear model. Um, the kind of things you want to look at are, for example, uh, p-values less than 0.05. This would indicate that your, um, uh, your model is statistically significant. Um, having a r-squared value uh, sort of close to 1. Now the word here close is in quotations um, because as Dr. Drews mentioned, uh, depending sort of on the field that you're in, um, how close you need to be to the value one will vary wide, widely. Uh, uh, Dr. Drews mentioned that um, in sort of, uh, I, I suppose like in most fields or a lot of fields rather, um, that uh, a sort of good value would be greater than um, uh, good could be considered greater than 0 0.95. Um, but as you'll see from the example today, we're not really anywhere near that in uh, in my example, which, uh, which is actually coming out of my research. So for better or worse, that is the case. <laughs> um, uh, and then uh, another important thing to look at is uh, the residual plots. And so as uh, he mentioned on Wednesday also, the uh, residual plots ideally need to be noisy because they uh, are essentially accounting for randomness in your, um, your model. So um, residual should be noisy. OK, so um, in terms of the syntax that we saw on Wednesday, uh, fit, fit LM in MATLAB was relatively simple. Uh, it just takes in sort of your two data sets, uh, x and y. Um, and then, of course, you would uh, so sort of need to define your um, your model. Well, your your model is is linear. So, um, uh, but in the case of fit fit uh, NLM, which is a nonlinear model in this case, um, our code becomes slightly more complex because we have to account for 
uh, our data sets X and Y, um, and then our uh, function, which will contain our model. Um, so in the code that you'll see today, it's, it'll be referred to as at fun. Um, and then uh, we also need our guesses. Um, so this is going to be uh, guesses for beta. And that will, what they will be will depend uh, largely on the model that you're going to be using. Um, and so uh, one thing to know about fit, uh, fit NLM's guesses is that um, similar to FSolve, uh, fit NML NLM is uh, very sensitive to guesses. And uh, I actually ran in that today when I was preparing my <laughs> preparing my um, example, and I'll probably show you sort of near the end if if we have time. But um, very sense it's very sensitive to guesses, and and will just outright um, crash or not run um, or give you terrible numbers. Um, any any one of those really, uh, if you have guesses that are slightly off. And in my case, um, I was my initial guess was off by. 0.1 and it and it will just wouldn't run but then once i corrected that uh then it, it would and so we'll we'll take a look at that later um so i'm also going to draw a comparison today between the linear model and um the nonlinear model so what i have as an example is uh it's this is actually an example straight out of my research so to sort of help you understand what this is. Uh, I'm going to give a very, very brief description of sort of what I've been working on um, to help give you some context to this, uh, the the problem I'm trying to solve, or at least one of the problems. And so uh, I think I mentioned this at the very beginning of the course, but in case you forgot, um, I do uh, computational modeling of systems. In this particular case, this is. Uh, um, what I'm working on is a uh, working with carbon nanotubes, um, which is the sort of uh, bluish structure that you see in the middle here. This is a uh, carbon nanotube, also known as a CNT. And um, on both sides of this nanotube, uh, we have bodies of water. So um, this is just H2O and H2O. Now, my research is uh, largely f uh, focused on desalination, so purifying salt water. Um, this is a very simplified case. So there's there's no salt in the system, but there's just water on both sides for now. And what we're um, what my research is largely focused on is sort of finding ways to control the flooding of water into the carbon nanotube, because presumably if we can determine how or why the water enters the carbon nanotube, then we could, uh, um, in a simple system with water on both sides, we can do the same thing with salt. Um, um, and so, uh, uh, so there's a question: Is this a mass transfer problem? Not really. It, this is uh, this is sort of nanoscale, so it becomes more of a thermodynamics problem. Um, now, without getting too much into it, uh, what I will say is that, and mainly because this hasn't been published yet, but uh, I, me and my professor found a way to um, sort of depopulate the CNT. Um, within a simulation. And the idea here is that if we could do this uh, in an experiment, um, then uh, then we could sort of find ways to pump uh, water through a CNT with very minimal energy input. Now, the problem that, uh, uh, the way that this sort of comes into linear regression um, is that um, in all of my systems, I have uh, varying sizes of CNTs. So, um, we can look at this in terms of uh, uh, CNT radius. And so we can have um, a data set of uh, different size CNTs. So CNTs are labeled in terms of um, M and N sizes. This has to do with sort of the orientations of the carbons. But um, what you really need to know is that they come in different radii, uh, radius sizes for the CNTs. And so in this particular data set, um, we have this is on the order of angstroms, by the way. Um, we have uh, radii of 4, 4.05, 5.56. Um, I'm not going to write them all out. I'll, I'm going to copy them onto the screen in a second here. But um, the, the basic idea is that we have a system where uh, we have different uh, size CNTs. And then we have a 
number that we're calculating uh, that I refer to as sort of the depopulation. And so um, within this system, uh, like I said, we found a way to sort of depopulate the CNT. And so um, we're, this depopulation number is simply calculated by um, sort of taking the average number of waters that would be in the CNT normally and then calculating it after we depopulate it and um, taking it as a percent. So this would be sort of just percentage of depopulation. And so uh, we know from uh, the various experiments that we've done that the percent of the depopulation is uh, uh, a function of the radii. So in this case, uh, the larger the radii, the less we can, we can sort of keep the waters out of the CNT. And um, the smaller the radii, the smaller the CNT, the easier it is to keep the water out, to sort of force them out. Um, and so in this example, uh, what we're going to do first is we're going to sort of plot out this model um, using the linear, um, the fit LM, uh, using a linear model. And then we're going to do the same thing using a, um, using a nonlinear model. And so when we look at the linear model, Uh, like I said, the code for this is, is you know, as you saw um, previously, relatively simple. Um, so we could uh, sort of write out our data set. This is the given data set in the code. So we have um, our X and our Y. And recall here that uh, X is the uh, tube radii. And uh, the Y value here is this is the uh, percentage of depopulation. Now, from a practical standpoint, um, it's uh, sort of helpful when you look at any given data set and you're trying to uh, determine sort of um, whether to use, for example, linear uh, regression or to use uh, a nonlinear regression. Um, it's a good idea generally to just sort of look at the numbers and sort of see if we can detect any pattern. Uh, the easiest way to do this would just be to plot it out. Um, and if we plotted it out, in this case, we would see that the scatter plot looks something like this. And so uh, if you were to just look at the scatter plot alone, you can probably assume that it seems reasonable that a linear model would fit. Um, and when we uh, actually do this, of course, uh, being a linear model, we're doing, uh, we're using a model that looks like y hat is equal to uh, beta, beta naught, um, plus beta one times x. So this is just y equals mx plus b, very simple model. And when we do that, we can, um, uh, after running the code above, we get this plot out here. Um, so the left side is a plot of the residuals. Um, the right side is a plot of the scatter point data uh, alongside the, um, the actual best fit line itself that I plotted on top of it. And a um, couple of things to note here. I, I don't remember if Dr. Drews mentioned this on Wednesday, but the plot of the residuals, um, so he, he did mention that it needs to be noisy. And as far as I can tell, looking at this, uh, there's no discernible pattern. It's not like all the scatter points are in a line or making a curve of some kind. They're sort of all above and below the, the zero line here. Um, and so in terms of, you know, does it sort of fit the requirement that we need for it to be noisy? Yeah, you can reasonably say that it does. Um, and so as far as how this was plotted though, uh, um, this, there's a relatively simple command that you can use. This is a built-in function of MATLAB. It's simply plot residuals uh, of your given model. Uh, so in this case, my model was MDL. And then um, apply this uh, second variable here, fitted. And it, and it just gives you the plot outright. Um, so it's a relatively quick and easy thing to do. Uh, and then, as of course, over here, this is just simply a plot of um, x and x and y. 
where uh, and then uh, on top of that, there's the the line of the best fit line. So the other output that we get that is going to be important into understanding what we're seeing here when we plot this is uh, the output uh, the output of uh, the model itself. And so in this case, uh, we want to look at a couple of different things um, that I will highlight here in blue. So the individual p-values, um, we can look at the individual p-values for the, uh, the given beta values, um, the overall p-value, uh, and then of course the, um, uh, ideally the adjusted r-squared. Uh, so in this case, um, when we look at these numbers, uh, it fits most of our requirements and one of them is sort of not quite there, um, but we'll take a look at how we can make that a little bit better. Um, so a uh, question was, how do you do the code for these plots for linear models? So I can share that actually right now. So the, uh, the code itself, um, and I'll, I'll upload all this code onto uh, uh, Canvas when we're done here. Um, Um, but the code is is relatively straightforward for just the plots. Uh, it, it's just subplotting um, um, one two one and one two two, and then so like I said, this is the line here that will give you the the plot of the residuals. Plot residuals uh, MDL. Um, in this case, I think actually this needs to be lin MDL. Uh, I adjusted that after the fact, but uh, plot residuals uh, linear model. Uh, fitted will give you the the residual model on the left, and then um, the other ones are just uh, simply this here was the uh, the output of the um, best fit line. What would a model look like? Uh, is it a matrix or a vector? A uh, model is a um, uh, it's a series of, uh, it's, it's, MDL is actually a series of outputs. So I think you would consider that a matrix, but uh, within it is, um, you know, the, the, all the iterations and the beta values and the R squared value and everything. So if you were to actually display, um, uh, if you were to actually display uh, MDL, uh, you would actually just get this uh, output um, here. So this is comes out of display MDL, or if you just if you you know input MDL and then you just didn't silence it, you would get this output. Um, uh, so for linear models, there's no need to create a guess for the betas. Uh, no, um, uh, it it you. For linear models, it'll generate the uh, the beta values by iteration on its own. Uh, so yes, um, this uh, like I said, I was sort of modifying the code um, right before class. So I uh, this should be win MDL. Um, what's the uh, what's the difference between R squared and adjusted R squared? Um, I actually don't have an answer for that. Um, uh, maybe maybe Dr. Drews, if you can help me uh, uh, give an answer to that in chat or or over mic. Uh, but it, it's uh, I assume it's in the way that it's the the function calculates. Um, uh, the R squared values, because I think there's a few ways to do it, but I'm not 100% sure. I can look into that uh, after class and then maybe send you an email. Uh, adjusted R squared has a normalization factor that the quality of fit versus the number of coefficients used. Okay, that makes sense. Um, 
for the y equation in the code, where did you get those values from? Shouldn't they match the estimates from the model? Um, so this particular, uh, uh, yes, they should. Um, and the reason that they're not was because I was playing with the numbers between when I took these pictures the first time and just now. So, um, so yes, uh, if I were to uh, rewrite this to you to follow the pattern of the lines above. So for example, this, these two values here are the uh, beta naught and beta one. If I were to rewrite this um, to be, to sort of follow that model, it would be y is equal to 0.88, uh, I'll round that off to 0.9, uh, minus 0.029x. So the, the code that I, uh, um, I know there's a couple of different modifications here, um, but the, the code I upload will be consistent and you know, runnable um, uh, once you download it. Okay, um, I think I'm caught up on the questions here. So uh, where was I? Okay, yeah, so um, we can get uh, a plot of um, the graph here, the best fit line uh, on top of the scatter. And uh, like I said already, uh, the residual plot is noisy, so it looks good. The only thing out of these values that is uh, somewhat troubling uh, that I would prefer to fix before I go any further is um, the R squared value. It seems uh, kind of low in my opinion, but again, that really depends on um, sort of uh, your field and sort of your uh, the mainly just the field you're in because the it, the values range widely. Um, uh, personally, I prefer to have values above 0.95 because that's one of the things I was simply just taught in statistics is get values above 0.95. But in, in some cases, and um, perhaps in this case, as I do more of this uh, analysis, I'll realize that it's just not possible. We're not reasonable to expect too high of a value. Um, in any case, um, that's really the only issue that I see with the, the linear model as it is. Um, and so uh, from here, we can go into a uh, nonlinear model. Now, the reason that uh, from sort of a, a practical perspective, the reason why you would go from a linear model to a nonlinear model is um, if you're not happy with the statistical significance of the values that you got out, um, or for one reason or another, you just don't think that the, the model is linear. Um, in this case, I, I have no reason to expect that the model is linear from sort of, you know, understanding the system and uh, experience with the system. Um, uh, like I said before, uh, in sort of this carbon nanotube system, the, um, the amount of depopulation, uh, the amount that we can empty out of this uh, carbon nanotube, um, it does uh, uh, decrease as the system gets larger and larger. So if you imagine that if we took this system to an infinite size, um, basically all the water that you can imagine would just flood into the CNT and there's nothing that we could really do to stop it. So if you have a giant hole, it, the water is just gonna fill it naturally. And so there is, a, there is sort of a um, uh, upper limit to the sizes that we can uh, use in these CNTs, not just from a computational practicality standpoint, but from, a, uh, from the perspective of being able to keep the water out. And so my goal in this analysis is really to figure out what that limit is. And so um, from the analysis that we just did and from the one that we're about to do in the nonlinear model, the question that I'm really trying to answer here is um, how much or what size, what size CNT is needed um, for no less than 5% depopulation, or rather no more than 5% uh, depopulation. Now I say 5% instead of 0% uh, just to um, uh, sort of make my model a little bit simpler, um, because the model that I'm going to use in the nonlinear uh, regression model is still a relatively simple model. It's just going to be um, a uh, exponential decay model. And so y hat is equal to beta naught times the exponential of 
beta 2 plus beta 1 x. This is the model that I'm going to be using in the uh, nonlinear regression. And um, um, yeah, so we'll take a look at the code here. Uh, so question function for p value in MATLAB. Uh, can you, I, I think, I think, are you asking what the function to get the p value is? Um, if that's what you're asking, then uh, it just comes out in the display MDL. It'll be uh, at the bottom. Okay, so um, uh, using this model, we're going to now um, plot out the uh, um, nonlinear model and fit, uh, fit this exponential model to our curve or to our data. And so uh, the code is going to be very similar. So here we have the exact same data set. Um, and uh, uh, we have some, uh, uh, the only difference between this and the other one is two things. Uh, like I already mentioned, we have a beta guess that we have to predefine. And then um, in the call to uh, fit NLM, uh, we have to specify the function. The function uh, in this case will define the model that we want to use. So MATLAB doesn't have a way to sort of take your data set and then fit a million models to it. it I mean, it might, I, I, but within using fit NLM specifically, this function does not guess the model um, that your data set might follow. And um, so in, because of that, you have to define your own model. And in doing that, um, because we're doing the model above, you simply have to define your function. In this case, um, we define a local function y hat uh, that takes in beta and x and um, is defined by this expression, which is the same expression we have above. So beta 1 times the exponential of beta 3 plus beta 2 times x. Um, from there, uh, it becomes simply the same sort of thing that we've already done. So uh, we can then use, um, let's see. We can then use uh, the various plot functions that uh, I had above. Um, and then we could graph a, uh, graph again the residual plot and the, um, the exponential curve fitted to this, uh, fitted to this line. Now, as opposed to previously, I'm going to try to sketch this out. The linear model hit about zero right about there, if I'm not mistaken, about 19.5. And we can double check that. Yeah, about 19.5. And so um, presumably, if we were to follow the linear model, this the linear model would tell us, in terms of answering our question, what size CNT do we need to um, figure out You know, when there's almost no depopulation? Um, that would be about size of roughly 20. Um, now that's going to be very, and clearly you can tell from the curve, that's going to be very different from the, the exponential model. And so when we look at that, um, before we actually go through any more analysis, let's actually take a look at the, uh, the values that we got out of the, the P value. Um, uh, and uh, R squared values and other statistical numbers here. So um, P value was uh, still very low, uh, 4.92 times 10 to the negative seven. And so um, if nothing else, we know that there is statistical significance to the model that we've uh, calculated here. Um, we have our different uh, B naught values here. So this is gonna be B naught one, sorry, beta naught one, um, excuse me, beta naught, beta one, and beta two. Um, and so because of our, because our model looks like beta naught times the exponential of beta two plus beta one times X, um, we could use this expression that I just wrote out to um, overlay on the graph, which is what I did earlier. Um, from there, we can take a look at the adjusted R squared value as well. So 0.866, uh, comparing that to the previous one, which I think was, um, 0.8, uh, 0.845 for the linear model. Um, we got a slight improvement. 
Now, uh, we didn't get that much of an improvement. And so um, realistically, the reason is probably because this random model I just, I, I literally just pulled out of thin air, as Dr. Drew says, um, it just, it's not the perfect fit. And if you just sort of look at the graph, um, it seems like, you know, the curve does sort of, you know, it's, it's fairly well fit, right, with the data points that at least exist there. But um, one particular problem that I, I know about this uh, uh, model in general is that um, the exponential model as it's written uh, will actually never hit zero. Um, however, uh, if you take the limit of this model, it, it does go to zero. But um, because of the, the form of the exponential model, it will never hit zero. And realistically, there, um, we could eventually hit zero if we just made the CNT large enough. So um, this is a decent model, um, uh, but it's, not, it's certainly not the best one that we could do. Um, in terms of how you would go about uh, you know, finding a good model, I mean, that's really more for a statistics class. Um, so I think uh, in terms of the problems that you'd be facing here, uh, you'll likely be given a model or just sort of be told to guess a model. Uh, and then um, make it as good as you can get, I'd imagine. Okay. Um, and so uh, I haven't done this yet, actually, but uh, real quickly, we could calculate the, um, based on these numbers here, we can calculate sort of what our uh, expected value to sort of answer our question is going to be. So remember that our y hat value is going to be, is representative of our percent depopulation. And so if we wanted to get, um, if we wanted to calculate uh, what size CNT we would need, um, we can simply follow this model. Um, oops, beta two is going to be, and then calculate the value out. Um, I haven't done that. So if anybody was interested, uh, um, feel free to do this for practice um, once the code is uploaded. Um, but I suspect that in this case, it'll be an extremely large number because of the way that the exp exponential model doesn't curve out to um, go down that close to zero. Uh, and so you would simply just do a calculation using B1 here, which would be negative 1.68. Oh, oops. So B, B not B1, B2. Negative um, 0 0.0653 times X. And so if you would, you would just uh, plug in 0 point, uh, our 5% that we want for Y and then from there um, calculate an X. Um, for y hat, and then you solve for x. And of course, you can all, you can do all, you would be able to do all of this in MATLAB um, relatively easily. Um, but just looking at the curve of the graph here, um, we're, uh, we're probably looking at something on the order of 50-ish, you know, probably about 50-ish nanometers. Oh, excuse me, 50 angstroms, not nanometers. That would be huge. Um, about 50 angstroms or so. So if you're interested, you can go ahead and solve that. Um, now, in the in this particular case, uh, I can tell you that for uh, with almost certainty that th this model is not a good model. Um, and I know that because I already ran the experiment uh, at larger sizes. And the, uh, the radius that I'm getting is uh, roughly on the order of uh, 28 angstroms. Uh, if I recall correctly, it's between 28 and uh, 30. And, oh, thank you. So uh, somebody calculated this just now and they got uh, that X is about 47 angstroms. And so um, uh, I've already ran the computations for, for the larger CNTs and uh, just based on this data set, um, there, uh, this is indicating that, you know, we probably need something about 47 angstroms to, to reach 5% depopulation in our system. Um, but when I ran the simulation for, I think it was 28, uh, so right about here, 28, the next data point, if I were to include it in here, would be right there. And so that actually fits our requirement of what we're looking for. 
Um, from a practical perspective, obviously, given that we would have to make do a computation of a system that's you know 50 angstroms in radius, 100 angstroms in diameter, that's uh, for those if you don't know, that's a huge system. Uh, to do like in terms of uh, it would take a lot of computational power and it's expensive to run. Um, certainly doable, but it's just expensive. Uh, and uh, from a practical perspective, this is why we want to be able to do things like this. So um, the idea here, remember, was okay if I have a you know a couple small size CNTs and I can figure out a linear regression model to or a nonlinear regression model to um, help me determine which size CNTs I want to run on sort of the extreme end. I don't have to run 20 different size CNTs on the extreme end. I could just run one or two. And that ended up being the case here, which is um, thankfully didn't make me waste a bunch of computational time on the supercomputer. So, um, okay. Uh, so yeah, I think that was actually all I had. Um, so we ended Quite a bit earlier than I was expecting to. Um, but if you're interested, I'm going to, uh, I'll post up the, well, I'll paste the, uh, the code that I use for the non-linear model uh, on the, to the screen right now in its entirety. And um, you can take a look at it. And if you have any questions, I will be hanging around here. Oh, uh, thank you for reminding me about that. So the, the guess, uh, that's important. So for the guess in terms of um, uh, these values here, oh, sorry, not those values, the, these values, uh, beta guess, um, that what, what values you would want to use uh, really depend on how you want to, um, what, what model you're using. So if we look, if we actually inspect the equation, equation that we were dealing with, here we had uh, beta naught times uh, exponential of uh, beta two plus beta one times x. Um, because we're do we're, we're we know that this is, for example, an exponential decay model because just um, by looking at the curve of the graph here, uh, we know it's not exponential growth, right? It's going down. Um, and so uh, in this case, uh, because we know that it's exponential decay. One thing I know for certain is that the, the value inside here, uh, inside the parentheses must be a negative. And so um, in this case, what I did was I basically just guessed uh, negative one for beta two and negative one um, for beta one. That was my initial guess. Uh, and then I just kept uh, beta not positive on the outside. Um, and uh, that actually crashed. Um, and so the reason it crashed immediately uh, uh, it, it, it reached, so what happens when it crashes it is you get uh, numerical instability in, in the iteration process and you'll come out with values of um, infinity for, for y hat at, or negative infinity for that matter. Um, and uh, MATLAB will basically scream at you that you're getting infin infinite values and I can actually replicate that right now. Um, but uh, while I'm doing that, um, when you when you get those numerical instabilities, uh, it's simply because the iteration process for one reason or another, um, because of your initial bad guesses, will cause the function to crash. Um, and so you just have to adjust your values. And so what I did then was um, sort of by inspection say, okay, um, because we're talking about exponential decay, and because generally I want a curve that will go sort of down like that, um, I noticed that this value has to be um, less than negative one, or sorry, greater than negative one. So it has to be between zero and negative one to get sort of that that general curvature within an exponential model. And so I just guessed point, negative point one and um, uh, from there it was able to run.
Okay. Um, yeah, no problem. How should we plot the linear model? I'm confused. It says to do it similar to example 12.7. 12.7. I haven't, uh, so to the person who asked that question, I haven't uh, actually looked at the homework yet. Which question are you referring to? Part A of one. Okay. Um, you are right that 12.7 is not a linear model. So that might be, if that's what it says, that might be a typo. Um, but uh, send me an email, uh, and um, if you have code written, send me an email, and I'll, I'll look it over. Um, uh, if you want to find a uh, linear model, though, uh, an example to follow in terms of linear models, look at 12.4, 12.3, uh, and 12.4 uh, are both uh, linear models. So you can use those as sort of uh, examples to start from. Uh, let me pull up the homework so I can actually answer that. Oh, there you go. 12.7 was referred to for only the way the plot looks, not for the construction of the code. So in terms of the construction of the code, you want to look at the uh, the linear um, model examples, which is going to be 12.4 to 12.4 and 12.5. Um, if you have extra time, could you possibly talk about the technique used to measure the population of water within the tube? Yeah. Um, so. So basically, uh, it, it's because everything I do is computational, it's actually really easy. Um, but the system that I use to, or not system, but the the, the software I use to uh, run these simulations is called LAMPS. Uh, if you're interested, you could always look it up. It's actually a free software um, uh, made by, I think, people in the uh, Department of Defense, if I'm not mistaken. But um, they, uh, they offer it to f out for free. Uh, and basically, uh, within this uh, um, sort of 3D modeling package, uh, you could um, you could create your own variables to define different things. So in this case, basically what I do to count the water in the tube um, is that I run a system uh, where I uh, run a system without sort of my magical depopulation construction. And um, so I run a full system so that the Typically, what happens in a carbon nanotube is that the tube will automatically fill. Um, there's nothing to prevent it from filling, so it'll just fill. Uh, it's thermodynamically favorable for it to fill, so that's just a natural consequence of what's going to happen. And um, when that happens, uh, once it's filled, I can sort of uh, run this over a long time span and then calculate the average number of water molecules in on the inside of the tube. Um, the way we do that is because this entire system is in a XYZ coordinate system, I basically just count waters in between uh, z is equal to say 50 and 100, whatever the values happen to be. Um, those are arbitrary values there, but uh, I, I just count how many waters exist, or rather how many oxygen atoms exist between those two coordinate points. And that would be how many waters exist in the tube. Um, from then I can just do the exact same thing, but do it once I've uh, sort of run my magical thing that depopulates the CNT. And then I compare the two um, and uh, turn it into a percentage, basically. Yeah, no, this is not a wet lab. Uh, if you were to do this in a wet lab, counting the number of water molecules inside the CNT would be extremely difficult. I, I thankfully am not a uh, experimentalist.
I'm going to start playing some music, some Beethoven, in case uh, uh, you're getting bored. Thank you. Yeah, I actually don't know how, but I always end up doing water related projects like my entire undergrad and graduate school <laughs> career. Whether it's that, that aquaponic system, if you recall, textures, or the, uh, um, des in this case, desalination, or uh, I don't know, for some reason my life revolves around water. <laughs> Um, I think, yeah, there's only six people left here. Um, I think we're okay to end things. Uh... Yep, that should be fine. We can wrap it up.